What, what should we be teaching our undergraduates? Oh. <laughs> Interestingly, we, uh, we attend the uh, Agile Ten. We we founded Agile oh. Staffordshire. Yeah. Um, <laughs> me and him. Uh, and the rest of the company was we wanted something a community like this closer to where we work. So we started Agile Staffordshire. So if you go to agilestaffordshire.org if you live in that direction. We have a range of speakers. We've got um, Kevin Rutherford speaking in, in the June conference, and my wife as well, who's a, a researcher in the medical industry and physiotherapy in London. So, um, well, that's good, good for that. So, back to your question. We've been speaking with the University, um, and we've been working with the University of Staffordshire. And we're now going yeah. to on. Uh, and there's a guy there called Trevor Adams. Yep. And uh, he's a lecturer, and he, uh, he ran. About two months ago, he ran one of the meetings and got quite a bit of uh, feedback from us on that. And I'd also mention as well, I think it's James Shaw, uh, the author of Art, Art of Agile. I think it's on his blog that, that there was something mentioned about uh, about teaching <laughs> uh, I can I can find the link on that, but... Offhand, uh, not sure. Right. The, the, the main thing that came out of it was pair programming, basic and test driven development, basic basic uh, practices. Because when when students get out into uh, industry, what what we tend to find is is that they've got no idea about about uh, pair programming, even uh, source control, red green, uh, and refactor. Uh, I think I think what uh, Trevor has mentioned and struggles with is the fact that, that uh, universities and uh, academia as such struggle with the uh, plagiarism thing but <coughs> it's a thing that we need to address Thank you very much okay, if I, I was going to just, just add something to that in terms of what to teach undergraduates um, I mean, obviously, there's a. It depends on whether you're looking at development level, uh, design, uh, project management, etc. Um, I mean, I, I'll declare an interest and say that I'm a director of the DSDM consortium. Um, but having said that, I think they need to know the wide range of agile, what it's trying to achieve. That it isn't a method or methodology in itself, so much as an approach, a movement, a culture, um, a way of doing things, and the ideas of working together provide other things other than IT, um, and the, but the help that the DSDM consortium could give if people want to look in at that particular area in detail is we have an academic subgroup which um, people can uh, contact the consortium and find out the activities of that. We are looking to um, get people involved in research, etc., and we can give some help with teaching materials. Um, you know, without uh, putting a commercial price line on it. So, you know, I, I would say treat it generically, look at the Agile Manifesto, look at where all of this came from. But then for any particular approaches, I mean, approach the Scrum Alliance as well and see what they can do for you. But I do know of what the DSDM Consortium can do. Oh, and we are still speaking to each other about the Agile Alliance. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, oh. Um, the other thing as well is um, I was working for a large company uh, based in uh, London and uh, we were trying to recruit, oh, I think, two people and we interviewed about 25 um, and a couple of them had the ink still wet on their MSCs from various London colleges and they knew absolutely nothing. Uh, it was terrifying, not, ag not about Agile because it wasn't a, an Agile company, it was just, you know, what is object-oriented programming? You've got an MSc in information technology. What is object? Got it? I can look it up on Google. No. What is it? Um, and things like you know what's a, what's you know databases. What's what's a primary key? Uh, and, and what the hell are they teaching? I mean, this one guy, the ink was still wet on his MSc, and he knew nothing about IT, but he had an MSc in IT. I was. Don't found it. Um, and that particular college used Oracle, and he showed us his, his marks from his Oracle project. Look, I got 10 out of 10. I was like, well, but what's the primary key, mate? Blank face. Um, 
And um, I actually, <laughs> if you have a look at my blog site, there's, there's a, a thing called Tumbleweed Interview Candidates, which actually I, I uh, posted as a, as a response to this, because I was shocked at the quality of the candidates we were seeing. Um, some of them were obviously people who've been around for a while, but a lot of the youngsters, I was so surprised, because I know when I graduated back in 1980, whatever the hell it was, I could have told you what a primary key was. I could have told you we did auditorium programming hadn't been wasn't mainstream now, but I could certainly tell you how to write code and how to debug things. And I had a basic knowledge of, of that kind of role and what was required of me. Also, I did a sandwich degree, so I've done it for real for a year anyway. But it scares me that there's a bunch of people running around with IT MSCs, IT degrees, who don't know anything about IT. It terrifies me. But that's just one of those things. And the only thing I'd say is that you need to make a clear distinction between agile in agile in greenfield projects where you have a blank sheet of paper, and agile in brownfield uh, software development where you have a long heritage of software evolution. And the two things are very, very different. So I'd just like to emphasise context. Context and people in agile are key. And that goes for your system development process, the legacy of your development process, and where you're going in the future and the ability of your culture, your organisational culture, to adapt to what Agile actually tells you. Because Agile is all about telling you what is happening now and you listening to what it, tell you, what it tells you. So that's a plea from me as a practitioner and a fledgling academic. This is a wee advert. This is a wee advert, but we're not in the business of selling videos, so I think it'll be okay. Over the years, we have videoed, facilitated workshops where IT people and customers are talking to each other about requirements mostly. And a couple of these videos we can release are available. And it really helps for a student to see a group actually discussing requirements within a DSDM style project, and then the, having seen that video, they can do a bit of role play to do the next discussion about requirements, which makes things a wee bit more real for them, I think. Katie can tell you, ask Katie if you want to your videos. You ought to pay for them, not a lot. Any, any, any other questions? Mm. All the people that way can see the beer on the bar, can't you? So they're not going to say a word. Anything else that we would like to? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Lars Francis, uh, about your Yaki. Um, I was reading an article the other day, and it was about a team who discussed uh, how long it would take to rewrite our code if we lost everything. Uh, you know, and uh, from the back of that, they, they put a, uh, on every line of code, that they wrote, it had a lifespan, and they came to that lifespan and they had to uh, delete it, or they had to rewrite it because it would be automatically deleted. Is that going too far to your, uh, you're going to keep it? Um, well, why do you do what you do? Um, sorry. Uh, why do you do what you do? Um, you have a customer who's trying to make some money. Um, so you as geeks have got this competition about who can delete code. That's cool, and it's fun, but your customer's going to kill you when, you when the website falls over. So I can kind of, it's an interesting exercise. And in fact, in fact some of the stuff, um, sorry Julian, I've forgotten your name. Uh, but in, in, you know, when he was talking about the Wolfpack pro programming and seeing like, the fading traces of other people in the code and things like that. But he isn't talking about deleting anything. If you've got stuff that works and is, is actually, you know, <coughs> delivering business value, why the hell would you delete it? Um, but I can see from an evolutionary point of view, you know, does this code justify its existence? But you need some kind of evolutionary force coming in to delete it, which of course is the person re reviewing that code and saying, oh, it doesn't fit my needs now. Um, otherwise, it's just a bunch of bits on a disk somewhere. And it's, it has no empirical use. Um, we, we do have a customer who is um, 
has a very, very large system, it's been living, living for a long time, evolving, and it is small talk, so it has this, um, say that the code is living in objects in an image that, you know, some of them may just have been there for a very long time. Um, and so they are going through this process at the moment of trying to track all the methods that are being used and not used. Um, but some of them, you know, might be used on a sort of every three month batch process or that kind of thing. So they're basically putting um, monitoring in to track everything that's used and then they can begin the process of automatically deleting everything that hasn't been executed over a certain amount of time. Um, so that's maybe, you know, a real world case of something a bit like that. But again, that what stays, what has value. Exactly, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in, in the stuff that's staying is because it's been used, yeah, exactly. Do we have any more takers? We done. Um, well, as we say on the um, on the program, then second and subsequent uh, iterations of questioning in the bar.